Let's get started. Um, hello, everyone. I am Lisa Rani, Director of Research at FERA. Um, welcome to the second session of the FERA Flash Talks. Um, if you missed the first one, um, you can find recordings on the FERA YouTube channel. So let's uh, continue our celebration of FA Awareness Month, the month of May, um, with some uh, exciting research from junior investigators working uh, on FA. They will present their work in five minutes. And they are committed to explain their research in very simple language that anybody without a science background can understand and are happy to take uh, all the questions that you have. So please type them in the Q&A box. Uh, as I mentioned, we are recording all the sessions and you can watch them later and share them with your family and friends. Um, and um, at the end of the webinar, um, keep your browser open to vote for the best presentation. The most voted presentations will, uh, will get an award. Um, I also would like to remind you that um, in May we have uh, the Lend Us Some Muscle Global Challenge uh, that encourages everyone to be active. Um, so uh, share your fitness activity, whatever it is, uh, with the hashtags that you see there. Um, you can request free tattoos and, and flex your muscles for a fair awareness. We have two moderators with me today that will help with introducing the speakers and take your question, Bridget and Christina. Um, but first, um, just a brief summary of um, today's talks. Um, today we'll hear how uh, cell models and mouse model can be useful to understand the disease and how important they are in research. Um, a disease like FA that affects part of the body that we cannot easily have access to, like the brain, um, needs all these tools because we cannot do certain studies in people. And then we have a final talk, on the other hand, that is a clinical st study, an example of how to study the disease in people. And um, what I really would like you to take home today is that um, we are where we are with the first treatment approved because we can use all the information that we can get from cells, from animals, from clinical studies in FA years, like the one that you hear today, and put it all together like the pieces of a puzzle to better understand FA and continue to find better and better treatments. So thank you for those of you who have donated your cells. Some of the researchers today are using your cells. And thank you to, uh, to uh, all of you who have participated both in clinical trials and in clinical studies, these non-interventional studies that are equally important. And with that, I will turn it over to our moderator, Bridget and Christina, who will introduce themselves and the speakers. Hi there, my name is Bridget Downing. I was diagnosed with FA at the age of 10, and I am a teacher in South Carolina. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me. Our first speaker today is Priyanka Mishra from the University of California at San Diego. And Mishra is studying, I mean, I'm sorry, Priyanka is studying the brain immune system in FA using stem cells. So whenever you're ready, Priyanka. Uh, good evening to everyone. So uh, um, I'm a postdoc uh, in Dr. Stephanie Cherpy lab. So here I'm going to present today uh, the past work and the current work we are doing. So we, um, as uh, we develop, um, previously we did the stem cell transplantation. So in that we show that the single infusion of wild type hematopoietic stem cells to the FA mice model rescue uh, the FA phenotype. Uh, and also we noticed that these hematopoietic stem cells are trans uh, are cross the blood brain barrier, go to the brain and differentiate it into the microglia like cells. And these microglia cells are transferring fetaxine protein, which is deficient in fetacataxia to the neuronal cells. So uh, they are making them happy, the neurons. So in addition to that, in continuation of that, we did the second study, uh, which is um, which developed uh, autologous uh, stem cells transplantation approach. Um, more about this study, uh, my colleague, Dr. Uh, Shiv Kumaran is going to um, discuss on 25th May. But in the current study, we are trying to uh, 
uh, study the more mechanism behind that, how these microglia cells are interacting with neurons, and what is the impact of fatigue deficiency on these neuron and microglia cells. And in addition to this, to prove the, uh, the our gene therapy approach, we're trying to see that uh, when we are editing these cells in the culture, uh, they are reversing the phenotype or not. So uh, to uh, study this, we are using a human-based model system. Um, we, are, uh, we, uh, we are using the IPSC, uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. These stem cells are generated from the, uh, from the uh, patient fibroblast uh, uh, cells and differentiated into the desired cell type in the lab. So here our interest is in the neuron and microglia cells. So we are differentiating these uh, uh, iPSCs into the neuron and uh, microglia cells. But in addition to this, we are also making a organoid, which is called a mini brain. Uh, so uh, because um, in a brain, a different kind of cells are not only the neuron and microglia, other cell type is also present. So we are trying to understand the impact of adult cell type on to the neuron and microglia. So that's why we, we differentiated uh, those cells into the um, organoid also. So when we are uh, start, uh, we are successfully, this is the representative image, how the, the neurons look like in the plate. And this is a mini brain organoid uh, look like in the plate in the lab. So when we start differentiating these neurons, we notice some very striking phenotype uh, in the patient cell line. Uh, you can see these like lot of dots and these are indicated the cell death. But uh, interestingly, when we do the gene editing, these phenotype are get reversed. Uh, we see very good and healthy neuron in the gene edited cell line as compared to the patient line. So to, um, and the same phenotype we notice in the 3D organoid also, uh, there are a lot of cell death in the, in the neuron, which is uh, from patient line as compared to the gene edited line. So um, to confirm this, we did some cell death assay and we found that the, the uh, cell death is more in the patient line as compared to the, to the uh, gene edited line. So as we know that the fatixine is a mitochondrial protein, so we are also interested to know about the mitochondria uh, in that uh, patient line and our gene edited corrected line. So uh, uh, when uh, we use a one dye, uh, which, uh, which is stained for the toxic substance, which is generated by the damage of the mitochondria. So when the mitochondria is damaged, uh, there is a lot of red uh, stain we can see uh, in the in the in, uh, in the slide. So interestingly, uh, in the patient line, you can see a, a very uh, red dotted stuff we found it, but the gene editing, editing reversed that phenotype and we are not seeing any damaged mitochondria there. But uh, to again verify this, we want to see the structure of the mitochondria. So we go to the electron microscopy that high resolution and we can see the organs, uh, organelles exactly what they are look like. So uh, you, uh, this is a healthy controls uh, mitochondria. You can see that structure is very beautiful and we can see all the structure intact in the, uh, in the control line. But when we move to the, fat, uh, the patient line, the mitochondria is look very diseased and we can't see the structure even of the mitochondria. And in gene edited, we can see that the structure is reversed and we see the mitochondrial structure very clearly. So this is again proof that the gene editing improve uh, the, the phenotype and the mitochondrial function. So this is all about neurons, but we are also interested in the microglia. So with the help of Dr. Uh, Nicole Koffel, uh, we differentiated these iPSCs into the microglia. And we noticed that the mitochondria from the patient are very, uh, amoeboid because uh, you can't see their branching because, uh, and they are look very activated. Um, in compared to the gene edited mitochondria, they are more branch 
and more healthy look like. And the quantification also revealed that the mitochondria, uh, the, the microglia, which is uh, differentiated from the FRDA patient is not healthy as compared to the gene edited. So here we, uh, we, are, we have a good platform. Now we can say that the gene editing reverse the phenotype and uh, uh, improve the mitochondrial function. And this is also a proof of concept of our first and second study. But in continuation of that, we are going to more uh, a study on mechanism, how these microglia and the, the neuron are interacting and uh, like uh, how the microglia is transferring to uh, protexin to the neuron. Thank you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you for trying to explain it so we can all understand it. Um, before I turn this over, I have a question. Do you collaborate with anyone in studying the microglia? I know that others have studied it. As I said that we are collaborative with Dr. Koffel. Uh, she's also in UCSD. And um, in with the help of Dr. Koffel, we are studying the microglia. Great. Christina, do you want to take some audience questions? Yes. Does anyone have any questions? You can simply type it in the Q&A section. I'll, I'll start with one. Um, well, um, how about, Bianca, you explain a little bit what yeah. the microglia does? Uh, oh, sorry, uh, can I can you repeat what, the question? What does what the, what what is the microglia and what? Oh, what okay, does it okay, do? yeah. So, um, microglia is a kind of defense system uh, in the in the brain. So, in the whole body, uh, macrophages is playing that role. If something is come from the outside, they they are uh, creating a barrier and they are trying to engulf those uh, those particles or those substance which is look toxic to the to the cell. Uh, so same in the brain, the microglia is doing the you know, defense system. If something look toxic or not required for the brain, they try to engulf or try to digest them. So in that case, they make the environment healthy. I hope I explained better for. Yes, thank you. There's a question. Are there any indications that your stem cell neurons are sensory? Uh, no, these are not the sensory neurons. We are working on cortical uh, neurons, not the sensory neuron. We are particularly giving the media and growth factor, which convert the iPSC into the cortical neurons. Another question, um, someone says, I understand there's a big difference between FA cells and edited cells, which looks great. How important is the brain immunity part? As I said, the microglia is working as a defense system. So they are, when the microglia is not healthy and not trying to like not doing their job, properly so all the immune system like all the inflammatory other like other all the markers are get up and they create a very toxic environment inside the brain so that's why microglia is is a very important for the immune system so for example if you would to would um mix the healthy microglia microglia with the FA neurons, do you think the FA neurons would get better? Yes, because um, the our first study showed that the hematopoietic stem cells, when transplanted, they go to, they differentiate it to the microglia. It means those are healthy microglia and they uh, go to the brain and they are reversing the phenotype of the FA. So that's why um, we, we, diff, uh, we create the mini brain organoid model. So now we are planning to do some, this kind of experiment to give them the healthy microglia and try to see how they are reacting. But but as I said, in the, the first study, we already showed that if we provide the healthy my, my, uh, microglia, somehow they are reversing the phenotype. Okay. 
Can you tell me what type of gene editing you are talking about with your research? So here we are using a CRISPR-Cas9. So as we know that there is an expansion of GA, so we try to re remove that GA expansion and try to correct those cells so that react normal then. All right, I think, Christina, uh, thank you, Priyanka. And thank you. Christina can introduce the second speaker. Uh, so my name is Christina, and I am a patient of FA, so I was diagnosed at 21. I'm now 32. Um, I live right outside Philadelphia with my husband and my dog, and um, I work full-time in the hospitality industry. So our next speaker is Wenyao Young uh, from Swinburne University of Technology. And she's going to be discussing a broccoli compound and its potential use for FA. Hello, everyone. Hello, my name is Wen Yao. I'm a PhD student at Swanburg University of Technology. And my research topic is about a broccoli compound and its potential use for free dyspraxia FA. My supervisors are Dr. Fiskra and Professor Bruce Thompson. And I also would like to acknowledge the contribution of my research collaborators from UT Southwestern Medical Center and the Illawarra Health and Medical Research Institute in this world. And thank you, Farah, for the opportunity to share our research. As we all know, FA, the hallmark of FA is the reduced the taxing levels caused by the genetic abnormality here and the regulated by the two processes here and reduced level of protexin affects any cell type that relate on protexin for mitochondrial functioning, ion transportation, and cell metabolism. The main cell type has been affected in the sensory neurons, as protexin is highly conserved in this cell type. And all affected cells are suffering from oxidative stress and the inflammation. Ultimately, cell will be dead without treatment. Currently, there is only one approved therapy for FA, that only targets the oxidative stress pathway. And therefore, there is still a need to find other alternative compounds that maybe target other alternative pathways in the pathogenesis of FA. One such compound with the potential to do that is the broccoli compound saprophyll, abbreviated as SF. It is isolated from cruciferous plants with the most prominent source being broccoli. It is a small molecule that can penetrate the cell membranes and cross the blood band barrier. This means SF can target all those disease processes happening inside FA patient cells, regardless of the cell type, including the neurons of the central nervous system. And in other chronic disease models, we find SF can successfully reverse those disease processes. And in a very few studies of FA, such as FA skin cells and the neurons from the rodents, we found SF can increase the fertilizing mRNA levels with 24 hours treatment. However, those models are not uh, physiologically relevant and not carrying the full extent of the genetic abnormality. So one unique feature about our research is we're using a novel FA patient includes the proton stem cell iPSC derived sensory neurons developed by our research collaborators. And these models do carry the full extent of the genetic abnormality, the GA repeats from the FA patients and the show the low level of the fertilizing. We differentiate those iPSCs and the cultural them into subsequent sensory neurons and with these three, steps, three stages cell culture protocol. And the reason we use this um, protocol is because it's allowing us to expand the cell numbers for large scale downstream applications. And we treat the sensory neurons with uh, SF and the, our preliminary studies do show SF can improve the cell viability of the patient iPSD derived sensory neurons by up to 40% when compared to the untreated. And we also found SF is able to uh, downregulate oxidative stress and uh, reduce inflammation and reverse the two uh, processes such 
regulator for taxing MRA levels. And to sum up, we found the broccoli compound SF may be a um, um, potential therapeutic option for, S for FA. Thank you. Thank you. That was uh, very informative. And then I have a question. So are there other neurodegenerative diseases that have been targeted with this approach? And how does that relate to FA? Okay. Um, you mean have SF been tested in other neurological disease? Yes. Yeah. I think I read a paper about Alzheimer's disease. Some people are trying to use SF for treating Alzheimer, and they also find uh, SF can target the like, epigenetic genetic pathway for the disease. So I think, um, but for, for my research, we only focus on FA. So I don't know too much about other disease. So maybe one um, clarification or explanation you could give is, we always talk about this oxidative stress. What is oxidative stress in the cell? Oxidative stress in the cell, for us, we mainly talk about the, the ability of the cells to cope with the oxidative stress, because uh, no matter the patient with disease or without disease, everybody will suffering from uh, some extent of the oxidative stress, because we, we are human, and and for the FA patient, they are more uh, have less uh, ability to cope with oxidative stress because they have a reduced level of taxing, and uh, therefore they have lower level uh, of NIF2. And I, I don't know if everyone can understand the NIF2 signaling pathway. So it's a pathway that can help us to produce more phase two redox enzyme can help to cope with the oxidative stress. So for our research, we examine the level of those gene markers. When we see the increase of those uh, phase two redox enzyme encoded genes, we, we uh, assume people have uh, increased capability of uh, cope with the oxidative stress. We learned in the res virtual study that we need to take way more than a and is in a glass of wine to make a difference. Does this benefit require us to just eat more broccoli or would it just, or would it also need us to take a pill with lots of SF to get the benefit? Uh, for my understanding, because the concentration of SF have not been determined yet and the people can take, a, there are, supplement of SF compound uh, available in the market, but we should um, wait until it's become clinical approval and then to make the approach. And also the concentration of SF from broccoli is not enough for people when we take daily consumable for that. So I think if we just eat broccoli, it's not enough. So you were um, talking about NRF2 and, you know, we just had uh, the first um, approved treatment in FA that targets NRF2, which is OMAP. So do you know if this compound has a similar effect that OMAP does? Yeah, I think uh, they also, because uh, SF is also a well-known well NRF2 inducer, and uh, shows anti-inflammatory effect, antioxidant effect. Um, these two are similar to OMF. Uh, uh, our interest in SF maybe also target like multiple pathway. So in, in this point, maybe it's more promising, but I'm not quite sure until I have the result. We, we are working on this at the moment. Do you plan to test this together with drugs that target other pathways of oxidative stress like OMAX, OMAF? Yes, we do. We, we have the plan to do that and also we are working on it. All right. Thank you, Vinyao. Thank you. Bridget? Yeah, ready for our third presenter is Elizabeth Mercado-Ayan. 
she is from the University of Pennsylvania and studying the brain of an FA mouse model. Can you guys see it just fine? Yeah. Okay. Well, hi everyone. My name is Elizabeth Mercadarion. I'm a PhD student at the University of Pennsylvania in Dr. David Lynch's lab, who many of you might know. And I'm happy to share my work on studying the brain and FA mice models. Um, so our brains are the organ in our body that basically process all the information from how we behave, how we feel, how we move. Um, and there are different regions in the brain, as you can see here in different colors. For, um, and they all interact with each other, but each region has a, a specific task. For example, here in green, um, in the temporal lobe, we have um, memory processing. In the occipital lobe, we have um, vision processing. But here, I am gonna focus on the cerebellum, which is responsible for um, processing all the information that is going to affect any fine motor movement and balance and coordination, which we know um, are greatly affected in FA patients. And we also know that in FA patients, um, what causes FA is a mutation that leads to the reduced expression of frataxin. So basically the cerebellum in FA patients, it's saying I don't have enough frataxin, what is happening to me? And basically that is my research question. Um, and I'm trying to um, answer it by utilizing two, two mice models that each of them has a different uh, genetic makeup, but they both present um, reduced expression of retaxin and also um, a, a toxic behavior. So the first thing that I look at is a, a specific cell type called Purkinje cells that are very important in the cerebellum. And um, some lab members looked at uh, Purkinje cell activity, and basically we see them um, a little uh, slower. Um, they have lower activity compared to control healthy mice. Um, the next thing that I looked at was at um, cell components. And uh, the first thing that I see is that this receptor that is needed for Green G cells to communicate with each other and with other cells is um, decreased. And I wanted to depict this by this blue sphere. So less of these um, very important receptors. And also I see um, uh, less expression of frataxin. And going on with the frataxin, next, I wanted to see where um, where is the highest frataxin expression? Um, because in the cerebellum, there's also many other types of cells. And for this, I utilize um, healthy human, monkey, and mice cerebellum slides. And I stain them here on green. Um, I stain for taxin with this color green. And basically, I see that protaxin is highly expressed or highly 
found um, in Purkinje cells, which are these summed in boxes and in the human monkey and mice. And um, there seems to be a lower um, in the Purkinje cell um, FA mice model. Uh, the next thing I did was to do a Purkinje cell count in each of these mice. Um, and in one of them, I see that there's some Purkinje cell decrease. And in the other mice, I don't see any decrease at all. So from these um, results, basically, I could say that, um, so we know that Purkinje cells are very important in the cerebellum. We know that they contain um, high amount of protoxin compared to other cells in the cerebellum. And we see that their activity, um, cell components are um, affected in FA, so because of protoxin deficiency. So, I could conclude that the cerebellum and Purkinje cells are potential therapeutic targets for the treatment of FA. That's it. Wow, that was awesome. Thank you for sharing that. How long have you been studying this? Um, I've been in other projects in Dave's lab, but um, this, so in Dave's lab for five years now, um, and in this project specifically, um, like a year. And so are there any therapies you think would target the cerebellum in the Purkinje cells or just anything that would increase protaxin might help? Um, I would say that anything that increases for taxin, um, because obviously every region in the cerebellum in the brain does not act um, alone. There's communication, um, for example, in the spinal cord, uh, in the central nervous system that directly connects to um, the cerebellum. But for this, um, a bigger implication, I would say, like gene therapy that directly targets these um, Purkinje cells in, um, yeah, in the cerebellum. Yeah, definitely. Christina, do we have any audience questions? Not yet, but if anyone has any questions, please ask and then I can um, ask Elizabeth. That was very well explained. Yeah, and I, I, I'd like to say that um, this is obviously, you know, in some way good news, right? Because you find that these cells, they are, you know, they have this, you say, a little bit lower activity, they don't respond as well, but they're still there, right? So this is, we always talk about how lofotaxin damages the cells and induces eventually cell death. But this is this kind of damage is potentially reversible. So this is why, you know, you're saying this is a therapeutic target or a double K because you know the cells, yes, they are dysfunctional, but they are still there. And maybe we can recover the function that they are responsible for. So this is, you know, in some way the signals, right? Yeah, exactly. Um it is easier to repair something than replace it. So exactly, yeah, really. that's wonderful. And um, I I had a questions about a question about um, you're saying that um, you're studying this this rebellion with two different mouse models. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit what they are and why are you using two different models? What can you learn from one that you can't learn from the other? Well, the first thing um, comes directly from Dave, and we know that mice are not human. And um, 
but one ma- there's no perfect mice model of FA one one of them has the other one is missing and so on but um so here i want to see the most um similarities between both of them because what they have in common is that they express less protection um and in this case one of the mice is a acute mice knockdown meaning that um we basically turn on a switch that says like um trash all the protection and the other one the other mouse um is like born with already less protection and yeah so one is chronic and one is acute A few questions came in. So the first one, how do you explain that one mouse model has less certain G cells than not the other one? Did they both present neurologic def- deficits? So they, um, yes, they do both. Um, but the one, the one that I see some Perkin G cell death, this one is the acute or really fast uh, first axon knockdown. And um, yeah, uh, I would say one of the main differences is the, the speed at which the first axon gets reduced. So in in the mice that that I see um, some Purkinje cell death is the one that we basically switch um, turn on the switch to knock down for toxin. So um, it's very um, robust and very um, how do I say it? Um, it occurs very fast. So basically, suddenly all these cells, I would say that they are missing their energy, their whatever component they need. So yeah, I would say because of the speed that protoxin gets knocked down. And also these the mice that I see less Purkinje cells, have um, a phenotype or a toxic behavior um, earlier than the other mice. The DRG sensory neurons are affected in FA. What effect does damage to DRGs have on cell cell liver uh, decreased, sorry, decreased function? Um, decrease function in DRGs, or what? Would, sorry. Yeah. So they're they're asking if you know in the degeneration that you see in the sensory neuron, the DRG has an effect eventually on on decreasing cerebellar function. The connection between the spinal cord and, for example, then the cerebellum are affected, which they are in FA, and and that can have an effect on the cerebellum. Um. Yes, it's especially um in the dentate nucleus of the cerebellum, it it connects. There's um very complicated pathways, but they do uh, connect with, they end up connecting with DRGs. So it's all um, a chain of events here. And um, we could say, we don't know really where, um, I do know there's a developmental component, uh, component in, that affects DRGs. So we don't know if it begins 
in DRGs and then it goes to a cerebellum or vice versa. I don't know exactly. And then we never heard of Purkinje cells before. Has any therapy, even in other conditions, been shown to affect them? Um, well, you just gave me an idea of something to look into, but I'm pretty sure, especially for the spinal cerebellar taxis um, um because Purkinje cells are the main cell type affected in spin spinal cerebellar ataxia so I should definitely look into into that thank you so I think that's all the questions that we have so we'll go into our last speaker um Camilla Whitesell. She's with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and she is studying how is diabetes in children with FA different from adults? Okay. So, hello, my name is Camilla Whitesell, and I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Pennsylvania working in the McCormick lab. Today, I will be discussing glucose and insulin metabolism in children and adults with Friedrich's ataxia. So the McCormick Lab here at CHOP is an endocrine group interested in diabetes that often goes along with FA. We know diabetes in folks without Friedrich's ataxia can affect the heart and the nervous system. So we are interested in identifying diabetes risk and progression in Friedrich's ataxia because of these organ effects. So Dr. Tamroff, the senior author of this talk, has been supported by FARA to study diabetes in FA. In earlier studies, we found 9% of patients with Friedrich's ataxia have diabetes. Prior studies also found that prior to diabetes, patients have glucose and insulin metabolism abnormalities. We believe that if we identify these early glucose and insulin changes, we may be able to improve heart health. While there has been some research looking at adult glucose and insulin levels and risk of diabetes, there currently are not many studies evaluating glucose levels in children with Friedrich's ataxia. We decided to take advantage of an ongoing clinical trial here at CHOP to understand glucose and insulin metabolism across the lifespan utilizing baseline pretreatment oral glucose tolerance test data. So we have hypothesized that like adults, children with Friedrich's ataxia will have abnormalities that suggest a future risk of diabetes. Our participant pool that we're talking about today consists of 12 children and 15 adults about evenly split female to male. The pediatric participants are mostly normal weight and the adult distribution approximately aligns with what is seen in the US population. For the oral glucose tolerance test, the participants will drink a glucose drink, and at nine various time points, their glucose, insulin, and a few other hormone levels are taken. Within this data, we have more specifically looked at fasting glucose, which is the patient's glucose level prior to drinking and eating, and we also look at glucose levels at both the one and two hour marks. Additionally, we wanted to evaluate HOMA IR, which is a measure of fasting insulin resistance. A HOMA IR value above two is consistent with insulin resistance. When evaluating adults, we identified participants with impaired fasting glucose, which is a glucose value at or greater than 100 prior to eating and drinking. We also identified participants with impaired glucose tolerance, a measure of glucose that is 140 or greater at the two hour mark. And these values are consistent with prediabetes. We found that approximately half of the adult participants were considered to have elevated postnatal glucose levels, which is a measurement at or above 155 at the one hour mark. While this is not a diagnostic for prediabetes, it has been shown in other populations with increased risk. Additionally, some of the adult participants appear to have an inadequate insulin response at high glucose levels. But when looking at our pediatric participants, we see mostly normal glucose levels, but a slower return to baseline than what is seen in the adults. The high median HOMA IR is indicative of fasting insulin resistance amongst the children. Some of the pediatric participants experience post-meal insulin resistance, um, and we have seen substantial between individual variability as indicated by the large error bars on the pediatric insulin graph. So going forward, we would like to continue evaluating additional participants and conduct additional metabolic studies. 
and we're going to analyze participant glucose and insulin data along with body composition data, pubertal stage information, and other parameters to look for correlations between insulin resistance and Friedrich's taxia. As previously mentioned, this data is from baseline study visits for a current clinical trial at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. This trial is evaluating exercise and a supplement in FA. And with this study, we will be able to identify the effects of exercise in this supplement on glucose and insulin metabolism. So if you're interested in learning more about this trial, please email Anna Dedio, whose information is on this slide. Um, and thank you for everyone for listening today. And thank you to everyone at FARA for this opportunity. And I welcome any questions. Thank you. So does this uh, study plan on being at other sites besides CHOP? Um, I know uh, that like we are still currently enrolling, but I think I'm almost positive all the appointments have been done at CHOP, but I know Dr. Tamroff also works at Vanderbilt. Um, yeah, but it's single, just that chop, I believe. And you said that this study was is done in conjunction with the exercise and NAD study, right? So mm -hmm. you've not enrolled separately from that study, but the participant of the... Um, um, yeah, the it's the clinical trial um, with uh, Dr. McCormick that um, is in its year four of a five-year NIH award, um, mm. currently enrolling. Yeah. What type of diabetes is seen in FA? Is it type one, type two, or something in between? And then do you know if glucose metabolism is affected by the progression? Yeah, so... Um, I'm undergrad and I'm currently still studying this, but I know that um, it seems that like there is a something in between um, going on with some of the data. Um, and then in regards to uh, progression, this is something like we're still currently evaluating to see, like looking for correlations in between. And can you um, maybe explain what, what some of the, these parameters are? For example, what is glucose tolerance that you're measuring? What does that mean? Uh, yeah, so um, some of the uh, things that are like mentioned on the slide, like the impaired fasting glucose and impaired glucose tolerance are parameters used to diagnose diabetes. And so it's seen when you, like when they take the, uh, have the oral glucose tolerance test these um, values for different things. So the impaired uh, glucose tolerance and the impaired fasting um, glucose, the fasting glucose parameter is a value of 100 or greater. And then the impaired glucose tolerance would be um, 140 or greater. And those are what are like parameters that are used to diagnose diabetes. Do we do we have any ideas of why um, FA affects the also you know the pancreas? Do you know if there's any dysfunctions in the cells of the pancreas? Um, I know that like we're still evaluating maybe why we believe that there are certain things, but it's likely like multifactorial. Um, like effects that uh, between like for toxin deficiency, there are so many things still being evaluated and studied kind of like we heard today. Um, so it's plausible that there's a role there that like affects insulin resistance in um, patients. Okay, I don't see any more questions, right, Christina? That's all. Okay.
All right, then. Um, thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. Thank you for your effort in explaining to us your research and sharing with us um, the results of your research. And thank you, Bridges and Christina, for moderating. Um, thank you for having me. Yes, and, and asking questions and participating. Um, just a reminder that the next session is May 18th, and we're going back to the noon time, 12 p.m. Eastern. Um, and uh, next time we will hear about more therapeutic approaches. Um, don't close your browser right away. At the end, vote for your favorite presentation and um, see you all next week.